Hello, and welcome to JD Advising's California Bar Exam Essay Guide. The goal of this guide is to help you find an effective and efficient approach to the California Bar Exam essays right from the very beginning. This guide will help you feel confident on test day so that you can conquer the essay portion of the California Bar Exam. If you have any questions about this or other resources we offer for the California Bar Exam, please don't hesitate to contact us. Some of our other resources include a California Bar Exam prep course, private tutoring, essay feedback, and one sheets. If you reach out to us, we'd be happy to speak with you about the resources that can best help you prepare for the California Bar Exam. We hope you enjoy this guide and good luck on the exam. In this video, we're gonna talk about how corporations is tested on the California Bar Exam. Remember that corporations now falls under the subject business associations, which does include agency, partnership, and corporations. However, we are going to talk about the essays that specifically test corporations and the issues that frequently come up in those essays. Business associations is tested somewhat regularly, but has not been tested as often in recent years as it was tested prior to 2017. That doesn't mean that it won't be tested. It just means that it is, a, it is a slightly less predictable subject in terms of when it will be tested on the California bar exam. Corporations is only tested on the essay portion of the bar exam, so you won't see this subject on the multiple choice portion of the exam. When this is tested, the examiners have always tested general law rather than California law, so there aren't really any distinctions to be aware of here. We have seen corporations tested as a crossover question with other subjects such as agency and partnership, like I mentioned before, and also professional responsibility. But the recent corporations questions have tested corporations as a standalone subject. So be aware of how it could be tested those different ways. Some of the highly tested issues on corporations essays include the duties owed by directors of a corporation, such as the duty of care and the duty of loyalty, and also the doctrine of piercing the corporate veil. Let's start by discussing the duty of care. Directors owe the corporation a duty of care when they act for or on behalf of the corporation. However, directors get the benefit of the doubt when they are acting for the corporation. And this is where the business judgment rule comes in. This rule says that there is a presumption that in making a business decision for the corporation, the directors acted on an informed basis, in good faith, and with the honest belief that the action taken was in the best interest of the company. That means that the person who is challenging the director's conduct has the burden of overcoming this presumption. So that plaintiff must prove that the director did not act on an informed basis, did not act in good faith, or did not act in the best interest of the company. So for example, if the director's into, into a really expensive long-term contract without doing much research, the directors probably did not act on an informed basis. So if one of the shareholders of the corporation wants to sue the directors, arguing that they breached their duty of care, that shareholder has the burden of proving that the directors did not have sufficient information about the long-term contract before they made their decision to enter into it. Directors also owe the corporation a duty of loyalty. This is another highly tested issue. In fact, it is often a good idea to talk about both duties whenever director conduct is an issue on your exam. Unlike the duty of care, the business judgment rule does not apply to the duty of loyalty. Many students make the mistake of applying that presumption that we talked about under the business judgment rule to duty of loyalty issues but it simply does not apply here. Directors breach the duty of loyalty when they engage of, in one of the following types of conduct. One, they're on both sides of a transaction. So for example, if a director is acting both as a director on behalf of the corporation, but is also personally interested in the transaction on the other side. Two, they compete with the corporation. Or three, a director usurps a corporate opportunity. Whenever you discuss the duty of loyalty, you should also discuss the defenses to the duty of loyalty. If a director allegedly breaches the duty of loyalty, there are three defenses that could mitigate his conduct. 
The director could argue that the conduct was approved by disinterested directors, that it was approved by disinterested shareholders, or that the transaction was fair to the corporation. As an example, let's say a man is on the board of directors of a corporation and he also owns his own office supply company. The corporation is trying to decide whether to enter into a long-term contract with this office supply company for office supplies. The man is considered an interested party because he is acting as a director on one side of the transaction and he also stands to make a profit as the owner of that office supply company on the other side of the transaction. So if he votes on this as a director, he automatically breaches his duty of loyalty since he's on both sides of the transaction. However, if it turns out that he gave the corporation a really great deal on the office supplies so that the transaction is actually fair to the corporation, then he can raise this as a defense against any claim that he breached his duty of loyalty. The other topic that is commonly tested in corporations' essays is the doctrine of piercing the corporate veil. Now, generally, the law treats a corporation as a separate entity from the shareholders for purposes of liability. So if someone sues a corporation, that plaintiff can only go after the corporation's assets The plaintiff cannot usually get to the personal assets of the individual shareholders. However, there are limited circumstances in which the court might allow the plaintiff to pierce the corporate veil. Basically, the the plaintiff is piercing that shield of liability and getting to the shareholders. And then the plaintiff can go after the shareholders' personal assets. The situations in which a plaintiff can pierce the corporate veil include if the corporation is undercapitalized, so the corporation doesn't have any assets to pay in the event that it is sued. Under an alter ego theory, this is where the plaintiff argues that the corporation is just an alter ego of the shareholders and the shareholders are failing to treat the corporation as a separate entity, or if the corporation has been used to commit a fraud. I have a bar exam tip for you here. If you see this issue tested, if they test piercing the corporate veil, you should discuss all three of those theories, undercapitalization, alter ego, and fraud, even if it seems fairly clear that only one of them applies to the facts. Now, if you're thinking that this doctrine seems scary and maybe even unfair to someone who owns, let's say, one share of stock of a large publicly traded company, don't worry, the court will only pierce the corporate veil of closely held non-publicly traded companies. So that person who owns one share of stock of a large company won't be held liable. Finally, I want to make a quick note about officers of a corporation. Officers run the day-to-day business. The officers do owe duties to the corporation just like directors, but often scenarios involving officers on the exam invoke the question of whether an officer acted with authority. Officers generally have authority to bind the corporation. The nature of their position gives rise to apparent authority. We discuss authority in the agency and partnership section of this guide. So if you see a scenario involving officers and you're asked whether their conduct binds the corporation, be sure to consider agency law. There are several tips in the guide regarding the ways you should approach highly tested topics. I already mentioned these, but I will reiterate them here given that they will help you get the most points possible on a corporation's essay. First, when you discuss the duty of loyalty, be sure to discuss those three defenses to the duty of loyalty. Remember, if a director allegedly breached the duty of loyalty, he could argue that the transaction was approved by disinterested directors, approved by disinterested shareholders, or ultimately fair to the corporation. You should mention all three of these defenses anytime you discuss the duty of loyalty. Second, if you have piercing the corporate veil as an issue on your exam, be sure to discuss all three theories under which a plaintiff might be able to pierce the corporate veil. Those three theories were undercapitalization, alter ego, and fraud. And when I say you should discuss each theory, I do mean that you should do more than just identify what each theory is. Be sure that you contemplate arguments that each side might make with regard to each of those theories, 
and also discuss whether there are any facts in the fact pattern in support of each theory. Having these different approaches memorized will help save you some time as you're answering corporations' essays because you won't have to stop and think about what you should be writing or how to organize your answer. You'll already just know. Another tip for success on corporations essays is to be aware of the basics of corporations law. If you didn't take corporations in law school, this can usually be a tough subject to master because there are a lot of foreign concepts that you might not have heard of before you started studying for the bar exam. And without a framework of how corporations work, this is a lot of information to try to figure out and also remember for the exam. So let's go over a couple general principles about corporations to help provide some framework for all of these different rules that we're talking about. There are three main players involved in a corporation, directors, shareholders, and officers. The director's job is to manage the corporation. They make the big picture decisions. So for example, if the corporation is contemplating entering into a long-term, very expensive contract, the directors should decide whether the corporation should enter into that contract. Directors meet regularly and they vote on these types of decisions. They need to appear for each meeting so they cannot vote by proxy or by voting agreement. Next we have shareholders. These are the owners of the corporation. Think of them as like investors. One of the main decisions that shareholders get to make is that they get to select the directors. So shareholders don't meet as often as directors. They're entitled to one meeting a year where they get an update on how the corporation is doing. And also at this meeting is where they vote on who the directors are. Shareholders are allowed to vote by proxy or by voting agreement. So they don't have to appear in person for their meetings. The third role is an officer. As I mentioned before, officers manage the day-to-day -day transactions for the corporation. These include people like the president, the secretary, the treasurer, and things like that. I want to give you an example to illustrate the difference between directors and officers. So let's say a corporation is contemplating entering into a 10-year contract with an office supply company for the office supplier to exclusively provide office supplies for this corporation for all those 10 years. This is a big decision for the corporation. So that's a contract that the directors should likely contemplate and vote on. On the other hand, let's say that the corporation has run out of pens and someone needs to run to the store right now and buy some pens so that everyone can carry on their day-to-day -day tasks. An officer can make the decision to run to the store and buy some pens because that has to do with the day-to-day -day management of the corporation. Not to make things more confusing, but a lot of times in smaller corporations, you might have one person who holds multiple of these positions. For example, if I start my own corporation to let's say sell cupcakes, I could be the sole shareholder and an officer and on the board of directors. If you see a fact pattern like this where one person has multiple roles, ask yourself which hat they have on at the time of the question conduct. Was that person acting as a director, an officer, or a shareholder during the time of whatever conduct is being called into question? This is gonna help you focus on exactly which rules to apply to this fact pattern. There is also some vocabulary that you will come across while you're studying for corporations that may be new to you if you're not familiar with corporations law. So articles of incorporation, are the documents that the corporation files with the state that brings the corporation into existence. The Articles of Incorporation are essentially a contract with the state where the corporation promises to do certain things and in exchange, the shareholders of the corporation get limited liability, which means that they will not be held personally liable for the corporation's obligations. That is, unless the court pierces the corporate veil like we talked about before. Next is a dividend. This is a portion of the corporation's profits that is shared with the shareholders. Not all corporations pay dividends, but lots of shareholders buy shares for the purpose of receiving a portion of profits, or in other words, a dividend. Next is subscription. This is an offer from an investor who wants to buy shares of the corporation's stock. If the corporation accepts the offer and sells that investor the stock, 
the net investor becomes a shareholder. Next, we have a promoter. This is a person who promotes the corporation before it comes into existence. This person might enter into some contracts on behalf of the corporation, even though the corporation does not technically exist yet. For example, let's say two people want to start a coffee shop. Before the articles of incorporation are filed, one of those founders of this company goes out and signs a lease for some space that they're going to hold their coffee shop in, and they sign on behalf of the to-be-formed corporation. That person who entered the contract is a promoter, and that person is personally liable for the contract that they entered into since there is no corporation yet to assume liability for the agreement. Next, we have the term ratify. This is a fancy word for approval. Usually, we're talking about approving the acts of the someone else, specifically when the board of directors ratifies or approves conduct that the promoter took on behalf of the to-be-formed corporation before the corporation existed. If the directors ratify the promoter's conduct, the corporation generally assumes liability for the obligation, but that promoter may still remain liable. Finally, we have quorum. This basically means majority. This comes up when the directors or the shareholders are meeting and voting on something. In order to have a proper meeting of the board of directors, a quorum or a majority of the members of the board have to be present. So for example, if there are seven members of the board of directors, four of them must be present in order for the board to have a proper meeting. Finally, like all the other subjects, it is important that you practice corporations essays to prepare for the exam. We recommend that you start by reviewing the corporations essays from October 2020, February 2017, and July 2015.